News. 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 New York City. FAQ NYC podcast getting more and more interesting by the minute. FAQ. It's FAQ NYC, the New Yorkist podcast from the newsroom by and for New Yorkers, the city. I'm Harry Siegel, here with Professor Christina Greer. Hello. Hello there. Hey, Katie Honan's off. She's making the media rounds to talk about her mouth-watering Bon Appetit story, the untold tale of the artichoke parm, the most mysterious sandwich in Brooklyn. Also out is Police Commissioner Key Chan Sewell, who surprised her staff and City Hall with the resignation note on Monday that pointedly made no mention of the mayor, who'd made her commissioner at least in name, even as he had his old friend, and unindicted co-conspirator in a federal bribery case, Phil Banks, running things as his deputy mayor for public safety, who she reported to. The NYPD email of the department's first female commissioner immediately started bouncing after she announced the move, which came just after the mayor reportedly bristled, though he publicly stood by, her decision to punish another friend of his, Chief of Department Jeffrey Madry, with the loss of vacation days for, in a story first reported by the city, getting a retired cop's arrest voided after that cop who'd served under Madry had chased after kids who'd broken a security camera with the drawn gun. Uh, the ranking NYPD source who first sent the city her, her internal announcement sent it along with the message, PC is quitting, the department is effed, and said, I worry about the moral leadership of the department now as the line of secession is grim. We'll have more to say about this, but first, Here's Chrissy with just some of the news from another jam-packed week in New York City. Thanks, Harry. Well, and also, I still haven't had this famous sandwich that Katie keeps talking about. We got to get on that. Um, so the Tony field Awards <laughs> field trip, FAQ field trip. The Tony Awards this weekend went uptown to the United Palace in Washington Heights. I'm so curious as to what the economic benefits were for the community in Washington Heights. I'm sure someone at the city will write an interesting article about that. In the upcoming weeks, uh, there are lots of plays that won. Shucked did really well, so we'll see if that sticks around. New York City's 60,000 app-based delivery workers finally got a first in the nation minimum wage months after the law was supposed to take effect. Former president and leading Republican presidential candidate Donald J. Trump is in Florida today at a courthouse for his unprecedented arraignment on federal charges, don't forget Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan DA, sort of opened that can of worms and kicked that hornet's nest. And now we see lots of other DAs from across the country following suit and AGs as well. Closer to home, federal judge Laura Taylor Swain will hold a hearing streaming online about the sorry state of affairs at Rikers, where the federal monitor she appointed, Steve Martin, not to be confused with my favorite Steve Martin of the Three Amigos, has been increasingly open and adamant about the brutal failures of the Department of Corrections on the watch of Eric Adams, commissioner, and former NYPD colleague, Louis Molina. Molina, the Daily News reported on Tuesday, just suspended a second department veteran, not for hurting or neglecting a prisoner, but rather for sending an internal email questioning leadership's decisions. Staying with people who have been incarcerated, lawmakers who have yet to do anything substantial about housing as the Assembly drags out the end of its legislative session, did score one big win by passing the Clean Slate Act, which would automatically seal most convictions after a set period of time to Governor Kathy Hochul's desk. So, Harry, let's start with, the I think, the biggest news of the week, uh, Commissioner Sewell's sudden exit. Surprise! I quit in an email. Ah. It was, uh, in some sense, to me, it was a surprise it took her this long to quit as uh, she was just getting pretty openly undercut and not allowed to entirely serve as the real commissioner. Um, Eric Adams is certainly not Donald Trump, uh, but I will note that like Trump, there's this thing where you can look at the characters around him and think they matter. And he's had a ton of turnover in the first year and a half of his administration. And in fact, the only people who matter are Adams and some members of his inner circle. As uh, our friend, political reporter Sally Goldenberg noted, by the end of Adams' second summer as mayor, and there's still time there, he's going to have lost at least 
His first deputy mayor, his chief of staff, his police commissioner, his chief counsel, his communications director, his homeless service commissioner, his chief housing officer, his buildings commissioner, and his holdover NYCHA chair. Um, that is a lot of turnover, not to mention his uh, TLC chair, chief of staff to the first deputy mayor, and the director of city legislative affairs. Now, Harry, I got a question because I had a, I had a lot of emails yesterday and texts from different people who were like, girl, what's going on? And so I'm of several minds because on the one hand, every administration has turned over, especially after like two years, right? People are like, this job is exhausting. Mm-hmm. You don't get paid, rel- relatively speaking, you don't get paid a lot. And so it's a lot of work, right? It's like 28 hour days. Is is this turnover part of it? And and not so well just yet. We'll get to the commissioner. But for, for these... Um, these other positions that Sally detailed for us, is it that there's a change in the nature of work? And so no one stays at jobs as long as they used to. You know, I've been at Fordham since 2009. I'm basically a relic. Like, you know, my dad was at DuPont for 30 something years, right? So I'm like, I'm one of the few people that has actually stayed at a job for a very long time. It seems like nowadays, it's not just the millennials and the Gen Zers, but folks are like, that's your year and change. Like, I'm out. It's hard. And for people in this administration, in any administration, does it benefit them to leave basically before the grits hit the fan? And also, you can make a ton of money. Like, this commissioner will go and consult for Upalachis, you know, police department and make goo gobs of money, right? To whomever. We saw Rudy Giuliani's police commissioners did it all over the country, all over the world, actually. So is it the changing nature of work or do you think it's something a little more sinister, disorganized. It has to do with the top-down approach. I'm not exactly sure. I know it's a huge deal if the police commissioner and the education commissioner leave. That's what, you know, different folks have texted me about. Like, this is a huge deal. But was it ever a good fit? You know, I said on the podcast when she was appointed, I was like, Long Island, he's clearly choosing someone that he can kind of dispose of because she's not from within, which had its own pros and cons. Like, is it that it's mutually beneficial. Eric Adams gets a win. He appointed the first female police commissioner. Commissioner Sowell gets a win. She's the first, you know, black female police commissioner. Everybody wins. And then he'll like either stick in some dudes, some white dudes, some black dudes, whatever, but, or maybe another first, but it's sort of, we did the thing and now let's get somebody internally where, you know, we can kind of work together and, and get whatever I want to get done. They didn't fully split there's not immediately like a ton of leaks coming out about the uh, schism, but every report notes that, that she was undercut uh, uh, by by the mayor and his tight inner circle, one, right? and that she wasn't part of it. Mm-hmm. And she took the job bluntly, like none of this was a secret. Uh, um, you know, Adam says, "I'm, I'm going to appoint the uh, first lady commissioner, and also I'm going to uh, I'm going to have a uh, my friend, the dude, who's uh, that commissioner is going to report to instead right. of directly to me." Uh, Carmen Best of Seattle. Um, I'm told was offered the job and a uh, former police commissioner there and, and chose not to take it. And so you end up with uh, um, so it was very impressive, but it had been the chief of detectives in Nassau County with a, uh, you know, vastly smaller department and never run something nearly this size. And by the way, was really won over the rank and file. The issue seemed to be that she failed to manage up. And she tried to, you know, like when when Phil Banks started having public safety briefings rather than the police commissioner, that was a big indicator. And Chrissy, the one thing I'll say is some of this is ordinary and normal. Um, but if this was a scheduled leave because these are exhausting jobs, you know, you, you, you've done your, your time as it was, uh, this wouldn't have been a surprise announcement and a surprise to City Hall. Uh, you know, when she puts out a four page email to the department that doesn't mention the mayor, that's saying something. Right. And, now, was he and, caught and, and by again, surprise? Was he caught by that, surprise? That's, that, that, that's my understanding. Um, my my half-informed understanding at this point, I'm reporting, but I'm reporting gossip. Um, and I think that the, the lots of this is every administration. Some of this is the changing nature of work, but some of this is, is Eric Adams, that he is, unlike uh, Steve Martin, the federal monitor, a bit of a wild and crazy guy. And he says stuff. And then expects uh, the department to pivot in relation to that. And look, if you were making a movie out of this, and this is Godfather 1, you might open with Phil Banks coming in as deputy mayor and before Sewell's there and personally firing the head of IAB. 
who'd investigated him before he abruptly resigned from the department in the de Blasio administration when the feds were also after him. So personally firing the guy who'd been looking into him um, and, you know, the bribe, the people were giving bribing the mayor and his chief of staff, basically the, the cop he was closest to um, personally firing that guy and then ending with this commissioner who was supposed to be sort of the buffer between him and the public and saying, we don't need that either. I, I think what's plain is it's going to be hard to find somebody who, who's probably as professional and competent as Sewell appeared to be and had the loyalty of rank and file police the same way won that. Um, when you know that you're not really entirely in charge of the department, that Adam's closest friends are above it, banks um, are, are are really running it, Madry. The, that, that's an incredibly challenging job. And it's not just the police. And of course, Adams was a cop for 22 years, but sort of across the government, you know, people run departments, they administer agencies, they sort of have all this power, but they're also just sort of retconning what they're doing into what the mayor just said as a presser on these big issues, very much also including the shelter system and uh, um, and, and the migrant influx. And that's Dangerous and not uncommon, right? Like Adams has never run anything this big himself either. His real experience with power, Brooklyn Borough President doesn't have any. It's just a launching pad for running for other office, was being a state senator, being actually very involved in the casino stuff there, which is playing out again, of course, in New York City right now. But that's really different from running a city this large. And so he's continued to sort of be a candidate, a front person, an avatar. And there's parts of that I love. I love having a mayor from New York. I love having a mayor who shows up at things all around the city and loves that part of the job and is putting in that work and is happy about it. But I don't think he's really worked out the mechanics of government and how to give space to the people he needs to actually be running stuff while he's uh, while he's fronted in the show. And I think it's becoming increasingly obvious and problematic. Right. But to be fair, right, who has actually run a city this large? Right. Mm -hmm. Before they become mayor. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, no one actually yeah. knows what this job is until they get it. Now, do mm -hmm. I think, and, and yes, it's great that we have a mayor who actually likes to be in New York as opposed to Iowa and anywhere not the city, but are we then struggling with a larger, I'm trying to figure out what the problem is. What is the root of the problem? Is it a leadership style? And in that style, is it poor hiring? Is it poor communication? Is it poor, uh, like top down articulation of ideas and a vision? Is it that He's at zero bond and not necessarily interested in like daytime mayoral stuff and more interested in nighttime mayoral stuff. Like I'm trying to see why it is this turnover seems to be increasing. I still think that some of it is the nature of work and people just know you can just make so much more money not doing this. But um, what is it? Like, are you, have you hired people that are sort of not a great fit? So when they leave early, it doesn't look great for you, but it's like, well, maybe they should have been in the job from Jump Street. Like, I don't really know what the root of the issue is because we still have two years and I don't want us to keep having the same conversation with this man. Like, I want to kind of get to it. And I haven't read anything that really like, without picking apart his psyche and, you know, listen, he's a cop. Like, that's the psyche. There it is. <laughs> you can pay me a lot of money. He's, he's a police officer. He thinks like a cop. He has yet to sort of shift his mindset, I think, to full mayor time. Don't forget, when he first becomes mayor, he puts on his police windbreaker. What do you, you all listening can't see my face. My face is really jacked up right now. Like, who puts on a cop windbreaker when you're it the is. mayor? Like, I'm, I'm fully frustrated. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the next few months look like, especially if this particular mayor feels like he's being backed into a corner and feels like the media is quote unquote picking on him. Cause we know that Sally CVS Goldenberg will come with these receipts day in, day out and start putting together a larger narrative as to not just the people who are leaving, but possibly why it is they're leaving. And so Sally Sa Sally has been demoted by Politico to covering some some other election that's happening in 2024 temporarily. <laughs> but we can't wait to have her back in the one place that really matters, New York City, when she's, uh, when she's done right. with that punishment. Now, here's the thing. First of all, Sally's at my phone is CBS. So um, when <laughs> we have to talk about politics, it's like this, this lady's coming with receipts. But I mean, in all seriousness, though, I'm trying to figure out before we get to election season, because we know that particular politicians 
do get a little uh, vengeful. Uh, they lash out. I'm not saying that this particular one does, but you know, hey, listen, it passes precedent. Then what can we expect from someone who's feeling as though he's boxed in and possibly working with a B squad? Now, here's here's what's fascinating though. This new crop of people that he has to constantly like re, you know, this the second second squad that's coming in. Is it a B squad or is it the squad that he initially wanted? And just couldn't necessarily get at the time when he was first elected. It's always you know a learning saying? curve. Yeah, because, like you're you know, saying. It's like, it's like, you know, sort of when you when you drink wine, you know, sometimes you go to wine tastings. They're like, listen, the second bottle of wine should be the expensive bottle, not the first bottle. Right? The first bottle, it's like your palate's still, you know, you're warming up. So, like, you don't need to kind of have the fancy, fancy one just yet. So, is it, let me kind of make some mistakes with some folks that are, for lack of a better word, disposable, and then get in the people that I really want. So then when it's time to actually possibly have a re-election campaign, I'm I'm working with, you know, I didn't run track and field, but I know, you know, like there's a whole strategy as to like who you put on which leg, depending on what race you're running, you know, if you're doing the four by four. So like, is he thinking of this as a long-term or is he just not thinking of it? And as most mayors do especially mayors of large cities tier one cities it's like it's on a wing and a prayer and you just hope that it's not too many tragedies that derail you from some sort of vague mission that you have mm-hmm. so so a lot of this to me is uh is the getting stuff done approach and what's baked into that uh that you're you're very carefully avoiding having specific measurements as to what that stuff is and uh, what it means that you're getting it done. You're claiming in a cop-like way, I'm not going to say Cartman and respect my authority, but there's elements of that, that you're, you're claiming, you know, officiousness and ownership of everything. We're going to fix the jails. We don't, we don't need this monitor who uh, Adam says he's losing patience with as the monitor's talking about the problems in the jails. Um, and you could feel Adam's frustrations mounting. So in the last week and a half, he's lashed out or whined, depending on your perspective, about controller Brad Lander, uh, about the media writ large, about his uh, administration's very slow response to, uh, you know, the, the, the massive orange cloud that uh, descended over the city. Um, and this I missed is all that. Adam's. <laughs> yeah, he knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 nice to be away. It's nice to miss the smoke. Um, you know, he, he's frustrated. And the thing we saw with Bill De Blasio, right, when he ran unopposed for, in effect, sorry, Sal Albanese for a not uh, sorry, Sal Al- not sorry, Sal Albanese, not sorry, Sal Albanese. You know, I don't get down with him at all. So he ran unopposed. He, he, Go ahead. <laughs> Like, like he cruises to a second term after prosecutors say, hey, this guy uh, did terrible things, but we can't quite say they're criminal because the Supreme Court changed stuff. And he says, I've been vindicated uh, by the justice system. Right. Like, that's the bar. It's very hard to run against an incumbent mayor with the base of support. If you can hold together a few fundamental things with, with your coalition and the state of the city, and there's not an imminent disaster. Uh, you know, you're going to you get elected once and you're there for eight years. And Adams knows this. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he knows how to play that hand and play it pretty hard. Um, he's frustrated and annoyed at what he sees as like uh, ankle biting lefties uh, with Lander, <laughs> some of the city council, all that. Uh, but then, of course, uses that to, to cover up, you know, the, the 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 ad hoc making it up as he goes parts of his own administration. And the reasons for some of this, like back to the refugees for a minute, um, Biden has done nothing uh, in terms of policy or money to help. Uh, Hochul has kept all the distance she possibly can to the point where we're to come about this in the news. Adams has to sue all these counties to try to get the courts to do what the governor won't, even though she declared a state of emergency and accept. And by accept, I just mean not pass emergency orders to explicitly reject um, incoming migrants, never mind that pesky 14th Amendment, never mind the fact New York City will actually pay the bill for the small number of people that they want to show up. So so he has been forced to do this on his own. He's trying to figure this out as a political hand. But 
we don't have a lot of clarity about what his broader vision for New York is that's very purposeful, and he sort of tried to to hide behind that. But with the second tier of people, getting people in who, whether you're publicly articulating it or not, have clarity, know they have your backing, know they're actually going to be able to get that done, and like getting those people to come and work for you is only getting harder. And every round of stories, the SUO one now, about how you know your commissioners are, are, don't really have their commissions to like do the work you've asked them to in full. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and Sewell Sin here really does seem to be a failure to manage up, despite the fact she wasn't fighting for the spotlight. Uh, that she sort of clearly knew the deal when she took this job, that, that whatever combination of factors, and maybe it was, um, it was the decision to dock Madry vacation days, which he's appealing and Adams has publicly stood behind, but, but reportedly is privately very annoyed at their old friends. Um, you know, at a certain point, there's only so much of this undercutting you can do. And, if you're not giving people both clear goals and the space to accomplish them, it gets very, very hard to maintain a team. And you can have the sort of churn where it's just people who want to have this title so that they can make money down the road and consult or take like a cush teaching gig because they've been the, the, the commissioner, whatever, for six months or 18. And you're just sort of staggering through. Again, I don't think that's going to lead to a real primary challenge. Or probably a serious general election challenge. Although, of course, Kathy Hochul in New York State is different than New York City. May, may have thoughts about mm-hmm. this, but there is some lack of clarity and coherence. And having a commissioner who seemed to have done what he really wanted on crime, where the violent crime numbers are really down this year compared to last year, which is an excellent thing. And this person saying, "I can't keep doing this job, and I can't even wait till the end of the summer and have like a coordinated exit. Like I've had enough." Well, why, like would, that is why, a would she, sign. why would she wait to the end of the summer? Because we know things pop off at the end of the summer. So her numbers aren't going to look mm-hmm. as good at the end mm-hmm. of the summer. You leave on basically a high note, you know? I mean, I was talking to different people in various cities where they're saying that their numbers right now are are higher than they have been in the past. And not mm-hmm. just like the mm-hmm. COVID lag, but like there's something going on in these various cities. I was talking to yep. someone from like Philly and Atlanta and D.C. Yep. Um, and so, and you New know, the, the exception. New York has been the, the, the exception. The show, something that we're doing right to a certain extent. But we also know that in the summertime, it gets hot and, you know, things pop off. So why would she wait until September where it's like, oh, well, she's a failure. Cause look at, look at these rates. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I get that. But if they pop I mean, off less than last year, right. Right. It's still a win for you. And that is the track she's been on. And I really bet you that the NYPD continues that this summer will be more violent than this spring. No doubt. It's summer. It's hot. Things pop. But I bet you that it will be less violent than last summer. You think so? No, and listen, and by no means do I want violence in this city, but I don't know, Harry. I mean, I just feel like there is a crackle in the air that feels palpable. And whenever you have unstable housing and employment, I and the shadow of COVID, you know, I, I know I keep talking about COVID, but it's real. And people are dealing with a lot of stressors. I really hope that you are right and I am wrong. But there seems to be, like, even when you see, like, and I don't want this to be a gendered conversation, but, like, interactions between women on the subway. You know, in the past, it was like, ugh, these two guys are, like, peacocking, get it together. But I've literally seen so many women of various ages, races, and classes almost come to blows on the subway over minor sort of bumps or infractions or you move my bag or you're sitting too close to me. And I'm just like... It is 7.30 in the morning, madam. Like, you have on, you know, a beautiful outfit. You're clearly going to work. You have someplace to be. Like, you are really about to fight somebody on this train because they touched your, you know, they touched something. So I just, I'm really hoping that you are right. But there seems to be a larger stress-filled vibe that is enveloping a lot of interactions in the city, which actually, you know, I I think I told you, I read that amazing book of short stories by Sadiq Fofana, stories from the tenants downstairs and takes place in Harlem, basically one building on 129th and Frederick Douglass, like a fictitious building. But there's that energy that feels very similar and reminiscent because there's so many people in in these, these beautiful short stories that are just under incredible stress at work, at school, in their housing project. Um, unstable housing, 
you know, inadequate housing, all these things. I just feel like that's where we are right now. And part of it is the nature of living in a city. And part of it is the mayor possibly not doing all that he can and should to ensure we kind of get past this moment. I know that there's some conversations still about Midtown and housing and maybe he's trying to work with Albany and, you know, but it, it seems like the people who need the housing most obviously aren't at many of these tables to advocate and fight for increased housing. But I'm seeing so, it across so, the board, you know, like, I mean, we know mm-hmm. middle-class people, I mean, we know that term is so loose, but who are really, you know, they want to move, but it's like, first of all, you need 15 Gs to move, like in the city. And then what kind of place are you looking for? It just, I don't know, it just seems very stressful right now for a lot of folks. It's really stressful, I think. And there are much bigger stressors coming. Like no one's going to renew their office leases. The value of those buildings is going to plummet. Mm -hmm. Our tax revenue is going to plummet. Much harder choices are coming up. Ahead of those choices, Adams is already in an austerity mode. And he talks about going upstream, but he's also cutting resources to uh, to help, for instance, get people out of shelters and into housing, not least so that there's room for other people in shelters. As he says, the inn is full. And he's been fighting the, the council and lefties tooth and nail on those sorts of shifts. In the meantime, in terms of the stressors, again, downstream and short term, like, look, New, New York's a tough place. It's expensive. There's only so much you can do about this. And one of the things you can do for most folks and like people who have to take the train twice a day, in regular commuting hours, who've got to go to work at nine and get back at 4 a.m., whatever the case may be, is to have some feeling that you're secure from other people's stressors, right? That uh, your worries about street crime are less never goes away in a city or anywhere else, that the odds of confronting someone who seems to be extremely emotionally disturbed or being confronted by someone who is are down, that there aren't people smoking on the trains uh, who don't seem to have a place to stay and figuring out what to do about them. And he's patched that slightly with a ton of overtime that the state has paid for. And that's the only reason the money's been there for that. And that money won't last. That was just part of his deal non-aggression pact, if you will, with Kathy Hochul, political non-aggression pact. Um, but th- these are all band-aids. He knows they're band-aids. And this is, again, what, what all politicians do is you buy time and you hope other things sort out in ways that help you. Mm-hmm. And and you can take it from there. But it really looks like we're going in the other direction. And these stressors, the, the, the regular, quote unquote, day-to-day quotidian ones, the ones with people who have much larger stressors in their lives and, and women who are lashing out at each other on the trains, men who are being aggressive toward women in those circumstances in ways that even if nothing else occurs can be very uh, frightening. And having that on top of, damn, I still got to get on this train. I've got to get into this place. I got to pay my bills. I got to come back the same way. All of that can and I think is compounding in ways that are already difficult to deal with. And I think are going to get more difficult to deal with as uh, the money collectively gets tighter. The reason I think crime will nonetheless go down this summer compared to last summer is that there was low hanging policing fruit and like competent things to be done to reduce the number of circumstances in which things are likely to pop off reallocations of resources that have happened. A big part of that involves these neighborhood safety teams, no, right? Which are, uh, are his rebranded neighborhood. Forget about it. These are the jump off cops, right? They have been very aggressive. Um, They are jumping off. They're having lots of car chases. Stand by for more about that coming soon at the city. Um, But has that done something at the edges to, uh, to lower the violent crime rates, to limit the Feels like it's always endless, but like the supply of scary stories that, that, that you can read about in the tabloids or the 6 p.m. news or whatever, a bit, yeah. And that, again, is a short-term solution. I'm not even sure it's the wrong short-term solution, but I know you're not going to police uh, police your way into dealing with economic stressors and like the other difficulties of city life. I know Adams doesn't think we are, and I'm not clear what his plan is past that. Besides, I mean, listen. We can't keep giving the NYPD more money. Like, I don't know how much data we need to see to realize that police departments, they need more money like I need a hole in the head. Like, 
They don't need any more money. They don't need any more overtime. Stop. Like, cut it out. We can figure out ways to reallocate that money to get more bang for our buck and actually help people. It's clearly not helping neighborhoods. So I don't, I think the rage I feel every time I see these budgets, not just in New York, but police departments across the country, it's not making cities safer. And I swear, if I see one more police officer on their phone playing Candy Crush, like what am I paying for? So, but this isn't the mayor that's going to have that conversation. He doesn't want to de Blasio himself. He doesn't, he doesn't care if CUNY law school students turn their back on him. That matters to him not. He's not going to sit at home like, oh, they turned their back on me. He would be devastated, obviously, if the NYPD turned their back on him. But he's doing everything to make sure he doesn't ever have kind of a conversation where like Adams and de Blasio both did, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't think he ever wants to be in the same conversation as de Blasio, especially when it comes to policing. So it's like he's kind of overcorrecting. A, because he's a police officer police officer himself, but B, it's like to make sure I am the anti-de Blasio when it comes to police. Because don't forget, folks thought that de Blasio was like the worst mayor. I told you I talked to, you know, my admins who all live in Long Island. They talked about this man, A, like he was their mayor. He wasn't. And B, like we were in some sort of warrior's hellscape where we're just like fighting, you know, zombies and junkies and drug dealers and prostitutes to like get to the train every day. It's like, actually, that's not the case. But the way it was written about under a de Blasio administration seemed like we were in this wild, wild west of New York. And I think Adams just never wants that narrative to start. I think he'd rather a draconian, I don't care about my leadership style, like my way or the highway. He'd rather that narrative than anything that looks like a de Blasio narrative. And I mean, listen, we all know de Blasio drinks Lucky Juice by the gallon because if he were any other mayor, this man would have been under the jail first term. But let me let me clarify that. If he had been a Black mayor, not just a white mayor married to a Black woman, if he had been a Black mayor, he would have been under the jail first term. But he wasn't. Lucky him. But I think Adams just wants to make sure that this is his administration. And in doing so, I think he is ignoring certain really strategic ways that he could help New Yorkers in a holistic fashion, education, housing, transportation, whatever it may be. But instead, like the lowest hanging fruit is more cops. Because that does make a lot of, makes conservatives happy, makes moderates happy, and low-key, it makes a lot of liberals happy. They just don't want to say it. Polling is very clear. And of course, it was just three years ago that New York City had its big defund fight right after the killing of George Floyd. And this is a big reason why, uh, you know, City Council Speaker Corey Johnson ends up not running for mayor. A little bit of money gets trimmed from the NYPD's budget, but like the slogan gets entirely exhausted. And it's clear that there is not popular support for defund. And in having that tight slogan, people who think that resources would be better allocated elsewhere, we have a vast police budget, now have to start from scratch and find other ways to make that case. I think starting with the benefits of social spending, they actually want and investing more there and then working their way to how how much of a uh, police budget do we need? Are there ways we talked about this Brownsville experiment that the city was the first to report on with uh, with folks there answering their own 911 calls for basically a week a year and that that often going pretty well. Uh, you know, how, how much policing do neighborhoods need? How much can communities be trusted to self-police themselves? And of course, Chrissy, this comes up constantly in all of our lives at the edges. The ladies who are fighting over bags, the ways we all, you know, maneuver each other's issues and like, what? No, now we have to have a confrontation and I can't back down and you can't back down. Do we want to call for an outside authority? Like, this is the fundamental stuff. And if we want to have more investment. It, it, we've got to start figuring this out now. And the mayor, by contrast, keeps pointing to states of emergency. We need more cops on the trains right now. We need money for that. Uh, we need to eliminate the right to shelter right now um, because we can't afford that. And saying we have to triage. And in the short run, the answer is always, always just going to be more Band-Aids. And of course, Mm -hmm. if a patient is in decline, having a supply closet full of Band-Aids is not a uh, viable treatment plan. But here we are. Here we are. uh, On that cheerful note. Yeah, yeah, let's end, you know, let's end on a positive note. I like 
you know, there's so much doom and gloom in the city, but there's so many great things in the city. Let's let's end on some positive notes. Um, I'm going to go to the Bisa Butler quilt exhibit at some point before it ends on June 30th. I am looking at tickets that go on sale on June 20th for the new Met Opera season. They have a whole opera about Malcolm X. So I'm going to look into that. Um, what else? What are you doing, Harry? You're back. We've missed you terribly. What are you doing to sort of celebrate New York and all the beauty that is there? Oh, uh, man. I got a couple of things I am pretty stoked about. Um, I'm okay. taking my eight-year-old to the uh, Bronx River to see. We probably won't, but she's excited. If we can spot any uh, beavers there. Ooh. Um, Do you need some binoculars? She, ooh. Ooh. I may need to take you up on that. Yes. Um, and prior to that, this week, um, I, I am intending to get to the second half of a uh, uh, pianist and composer, Ethan Iverson, formerly The Bad Plus, his new Sano Fest that's happening in Brooklyn and screaming, by the way, um, to, to hear some of the ridiculous uh, uh, jazz and other musicians who are playing there in some fascinating uh, combinations. Uh, which I cannot wait for. If you happen to be hearing this on Tuesday and we get the pot up on time, I know Iverson is playing with violinist Miranda Cuxon at uh, 7.30 tonight. I'll still be in this office and working, but I am 100% uh, streaming that and looking forward to it. Oh, it's I'm going to a Mets city. game. I'm going to a Mets game at the end of the month. Ah, we'll excited. see if they... Um, yeah, yeah, that, that, that is exciting. Um, uh, we, we were not, we're ending on a positive note, so we're not going to talk about casinos <laughs> or how badly the Mets are doing. No, 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 no. Um, oh, and for those of you who haven't checked it out, please check out Katie Honan's brilliant article mm-hmm. about the um, artichoke parm sandwich. I'm not a fan of artichoke at all, but that article had my mouth watering in Bon Appetit. Um and so Katie and can we just mentioned. add there that if you want to if you dig it and you want to check it out and Chrissy this is walking distance Mama Louise's Hero Shop in Prospect Lefferts Gardens Mama Louise's nine dollars Hero Shop okay can do will do oh and last thing the summer I'm checking out at New York Botanic Garden so that's the one in the Bronx because I always go to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden since it's just a beautiful little stroll but they've got some really interesting exhibits going on all summer. Uh, and one of them is like highlighting this African American artist that I'm blanking on right now. Um, but yeah, so hopefully our listeners will get out into the city. Obviously, I'll be birding quite a bit. Um, I interviewed Christian Cooper yesterday, and we had some tech issues, so I get to interview him again today. Um, and where can listeners find that when it's ready? Uh, it'll be on my other podcast. You know, I like cheat on you and Katie every now and again. Um, I have the blackest questions on the Grio. You can find it on Spotify. We were going to be at the 92nd Street Y, but they canceled on us for whatever reason. They said they had something to do. Um, yeah, oh, it's don't know what. Um, but yeah, so we'll reschedule that and I'll be sure to let you all know because he's actually doing something uh, called NYCHA in Nature. So he and some other folks, uh, birding folks, are actually working with NYCHA residents to get them out of their apartments and into nature and bird watching. You all know I'm a big bird nerd. So um, I'm really excited to hear more about that project um, To since there's so much bird diversity in New York City. Well, Adam is texting us, stick the landing, stick the landing, oh. and we're on our second or third landing. I've got a fourth and final landing that's actually <laughs> very exciting. Breaking news as we're recording this just before 10 a.m. on Tuesday morning. Step back, go to the city.nyc and read Jonathan Custodio's article Bronx Opera House, where they dance the pachanga, could become a landmark. It's pretty awesome New York history. It's got vaudeville, it's got a donkey opera star being kidnapped by a red automobile. It's got uh, some of the uh, real stars of the New Yorican scene in their youth. Ray Barreto, Tito Rodriguez, uh, uh, Fania Records founder, musical director, Johnny Pacheo, and the Palmieri brothers all playing there. And the Landmark Preservation Commission voted this morning, nine to nothing, to make the Bronx Opera House has an incredible history. I didn't. I did not even get into the part where it became a Pentecostal church. 
all through the late 80s and early 90s. It's a landmark, and you can read all about it, and uh, you should go up and see it. And with that, yeah. We'll see you next week. F-A-Q. This has been FAQ NYC. We're a part of the city. A nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom dedicated to hard hitting reporting that serves the people of New York. Our work is freely available to everyone at thecity.nyc and is supported by listeners and readers like you. Go to thecity.nyc slash give if you'd like to pitch in. We are an affiliate of NYU's McSilver Institute for Poverty, Policy, and Research and are a proud member of the Brickhouse Cooperative of independent journalists, critics, and artists. Find it all at popula.com. Our hosts this episode were Christina Greer and Harry Siegel, who's also our executive producer. And I'm our engineer, Adam Camara. As ever, thank you, listener, for joining us and making it this far. Be kind, be cool, and we'll be back soon with more.